Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alistair McGrath, and I'm the Deputy Chair of Science and Medicine. And uh, on behalf of the Ian Ramsey Centre, one of the sponsoring institutions of NIDA, I'd like to welcome you and say how delighted we are, both by the eminence of our speaker and the, the, the exciting nature of the topic tonight. I think it's going to be a fascinating meeting for us all. Uh, our, one of our concerns is uh, fostering a dialogue between science and the wider culture and human religion, and we have no doubt that this evening's uh, lecture is going to do exactly that. So I have a privilege of welcoming you to this audience, but I hand over now to my colleague who's going to introduce our speaker and also give you a welcome on behalf of the other sponsoring institutions tonight. Good evening, thank you. Um, my name is Nikolai Sarkovsky-Rode, and together with Ralph Weir, we'd like to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Water in Blackfriars Hall, um, which together with the Ian Ramsey Centre are collaborating on the Humane Philosophy Project, which we represent. But most of all, to welcome uh, our speaker this evening, Hubert Dreyfus. Um, uh, Hubert Dreyfus is a professor um, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and among other uh, distinctions, he was elected a fellow of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001. Um, he was awarded the uh, Harbison Prize uh, by the University of California, as well as receiving an honorary doctorate from the um, University of uh, Erasmus, or Erasmus University. Um, his interests include uh, philosophy of psychology and the philosophical implications of artificial intelligence, and perhaps his most widely read and recognized book is the 1972 uh, What Computers Still Can't Do, which was followed uh, 20 years later uh, by uh, What Computers Still Can't Do. Uh, uh, among his other interests are phenomenology and existentialism, uh, and his famous exegesis of uh, Martin Heidegger has become recognized under the name Dreidegger, uh, and tonight, of Dreidiger. course, another interest uh, of uh, Professor Dreyfus is going to be the focus on the talk, which is the philosophy of literature. And uh, his talk, uh, focused on Dostoevsky, will perhaps be the witness to the birth of Dreyfusky. So <laughs> <laughs> please give a very, very warm welcome to our eminent speaker this evening, Professor Hubert Dreyfus. So this is going to be relatively simple once you get the key to, to it. The, I think the Brothers Karamazov has been largely misunderstood. I mean, the, I know the Grand Inquisitor story is totally misunderstood, but that's a subject for another lecture. But what, what I want to say today is that Dostoevsky's got one important preoccupation, and as he puts it, and I put it, I read it here, thought, well, Father P Piazzi, one of the monks, Oh, who is sort of fathering Zos, uh, um, Alyosha around, says to Alyosha, the science of this world has become a great power, has analyzed everything divine, and after this cruel analysis, we have nothing left of what was sacred of old. Now, that's serious. I mean, if, if it's true that science is wiping out the sacred, then the culture is in for a very bad time, but there's a, a sort of hint almost to me with it. Well, it happens at the very end of the book, but it could have happened very, at the very beginning of the book. We, we find out the Father Zosima saying, people talk to you a great deal about your education, but some good, sacred memory, I mean, stressing sacred, because there, we were just told by Father Piazzi that the sacred has been wiped out. Now, now Zosima is telling Asha, Alyosha that some good sacred memory preserved from childhood is perhaps the best education. Now, that's, that's a kind of hint of, of, the, of the answer. In some way, something must be going on in which science is flourishing, and I, I think everybody's agreeing about that, from the monks on the one hand to Yvonne, uh, a, a kind of fan of Western science on the other, that it's, it's clear what's going on with science, but what isn't clear is what's going on with the sacred memory business. Is, sacred, is, is the sacred wiped out or isn't the sacred wiped out? And it takes a while to collect the clues, but the... One, one clue is that what you find in what happens 
in, in the book, and you all have your handout, we're, we're number two now on the, on the handout, where there, there is, we read that Alyosha remembers one still summer evening, an open window, the slanting rays of the, sun, of the setting sun, that he, that he recalled most vividly of all. I sort of put that aside as a question within the question. I can't talk about everything at once, but what in the world is this about this slanting rays of the sun, which is, mo- which is the most, Im- most vivid thing that Alyosha remembers? He doesn't remember the sun, sort of the glorious light of the supreme being. He, doesn't, he remembers the santri- sant- slanting rays, most, mostly often of the setting sun in, in the book. It's seven times uh, uh, Dostoevsky talks about these slanting rays. And it's important to figure out what he's thinking about. But let's fi- finish it. So there he's remembering the slanting rays of the setting sun. That he recalled most vividly of all. In a corner of the room, the holy image, and on her knees before the image, his mother sobbing hysterically praying to the mother of God, holding him up in both arms as, uh, to the image as though putting him under the mother's protection. Somehow, something that his mother is doing for him when she does this is making the, his life uh, really safer and more loving. It's her passing on to him this possibility of some, a loving relationship in the chain of loving relationships that Dostoevsky talks about as the onion chain for reasons that I can't go into right now. Uh, But what's happening here is something that we don't really understand yet, but the clue comes in a very strange place, and it comes in a very strange way. This is number two on the handout, the the part that um, about the German doctor, I'm going on to read now. Uh, the, ha, besides this story about Alyosha and his mother, something similar happens. Somebody makes some act of love to somebody, to, of caring about them, and that that makes a big difference in their lives. It happens here with the German doctor. He, he, the German doctor tells how he, that is, Dimitri, no, no, sorry, how he, the German doctor, brought Dimitri a pound of nuts, for no one before had ever brought the boy a pound of nuts. And, I, and, then, and then the doctor says, and this is the clue to everything that's going to go on from now on, though it's a very mysterious clue. Out of nowhere, and almost laughably, the doctor goes on, having given the boy a pound of nuts, he, he says, and I lifted my finger and said to him, boy, got their father? He laughed and said, got their father, got their son. He laughed and again, list, got their son. And they're highly good guys. And what is going on there? What happened? Well, he was baptismed, ba- baptized. Only well, you can't tell exactly. It's a funny way of being baptized. But why is the German doctor giving him this connection with loving relationships, the first and all, uh, he's ever had, and telling it in the name of saying in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, it's, it's obviously a clue that there is some kind of experience of the passing on of love and protection and caring, which uh, Alyosha's mother passes it on to him, and the German doctor passing it on to, to, uh, Ali, uh, to Dimitri. And that connection is that they're put in the connectedness network of, er- of, of everybody with everybody. That's what's going on with the rays of sun, I think. It, 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 later, Dostoevsky says, there seem to be threads from all those innumerable worlds of God linking his soul to them, and it was trembling all over in contact with other worlds. That's the extreme of this connectedness. But all of this connectedness takes place in a way which is related to being baptized. They're all connected with getting, inter- getting connected with connectedness that, that Dostoevsky thinks is what's ultimately important. And, uh, and 
the, the rays of light show up again and again, and they always show up where love is being passed on. So the, you're, you're now down to uh, looking still under number two, but I'm to, to what I'm calling an apostolic succession of sorts, because it isn't about bishops, but it's about how love gets passed on from Markle to Alyosha. Zosima says, I remember I went once into Markle's room, and there there were no, other, no one else, and it was a bright evening, the sun was setting, the whole room was lighted up, that's the rays again. He beckoned me and I went up to him, he put his hand on my shoulders and looked into my face tenderly, lovingly, he said nothing for a minute, only looked at me like that. Well, he said, run and play now, enjoy life for me too. Markle is really the Jesus figure in the book, and he's really passing on agape love to um, Alyosha, to Zosima. That's right. Markle is passing it on to Zosima, and 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 that's and and Dostoevsky makes it makes it clear, well, sort of clear, that something goes on in which something sacred is happening even though there, there's plenty to be pessimist about, that science may be wiping out the sacred. The, safe, the science has certainly not wiped out the sacred. It happened when Alyosha's mother held her up uh, to the icon, and it happened when the doctor gave uh, Dimitri the uh, pound of nuts and said, and said a, a blessing over him. And whenever it does... Um, it's sort of taken up by Dostoevsky in a way where something sacred happens which doesn't violate the laws of physics and chemistry. So baptism isn't some kind of magical putting of holy water on, on a baby. Baptism is somehow doing some caring something that gets somebody in relation to this whole network of caring. And that's that's why the doctor's quote is important there, and that's why baptism is in, in, in the story. It puts it, baptism in a, non, in a non-magical way does what baptism might do in a kind of magical way, but in a non-magical way, baptism is anything that happens that puts people into the religious dimension, passed on, the love, the chain of agape love to them. And now comes the fun part. I mean, it, it's, it already looks like Dostoevsky has a peculiar feature, which I, I, you've already heard it because I just said it, but I'm going to say it again. When, when he does one of these jobs of describing some sacred Christian practice, and showing that it's not against the laws of physics and chemistry, but it <clears throat> has a transforming power. When he does that, he tells you that that's what he's done. That's, so that's why, you, why in the world the German doctor just suddenly creeps up and in, 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 pops up in the story and does the, 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 the talk over the bat- baptized child is that the, the it's telling us, and that's what the whole book is going to tell you, in about, I think, about 25 different places. I was going to make a whole list of them, but it got so long I didn't do it. But anyway, all these Christian sacraments, practices, uh, experiences, sort of the phenomenology of the Christian sacred is what Dostoevsky is really interested in. And if he can do it, if he can show that the Christian sacred is still, so to speak, alive and welling, well, even though science is thriving too, he will have done what he needs to do. And the question is to follow how he does it. And every time he does it, you'll find some clue, sometimes much clearer than the clues I've told you so far, that he knows that's what he's done. And now that's what we want to do, is now get a clear clue which is more than a clue. It sort of hits you over the head. And, and, and Dostoevsky tells you, look, here's the sacred doing the job of the, of the sacred right in front of you, and I'll just name it. 
Well, so let's say he takes on some, one, another Christian uh, belief or practice or whatever, and something that believing in miracles. Now, how surely Dostoevsky is not going to try to say, that, is he, that miracles are sacred? I mean, miracles are supposed to be exactly not in... Uh, the, well, he could say miracles are sacred, I'm sorry. But what he, he, can't, he can't say is that miracles obey the laws of physics and chemistry. They're supposed to be the breakthrough against physics and chemistry is that there are miracles. But Dostoevsky's going to pull it off so that there are going to be miracles and they're going to not break the laws of physics and chemistry, but they're going to do a certain miracle job, and you're supposed to see it. And so here's where you're going to see it on page 320. Well, 320 is too late, and this is too early. So let's look. It's only we're going to be on 320. Where's my copy of it? You have my copy. I have my copy. Let's look at 320 and see what's there. Okay, well, what happens is a complicated part of the plot that Rakitin brings Alyosha to Grushenka. It turns out she's going to pay Grushenka. He's that uh, Rakitin who is the devil figure in the book, by the way, and he always says, when, when Rakitin says something, he often says, and the devil only knows. And it turns out to be something that only Rakitin knows because he's some evil thing up, up to. And here is, now we're, we're going to find out that when Alyosha goes, lets Rakitin get him to a, a drink alcohol and eat meat and finally go to be seduced by Grushenka and Rakitin is feeling very pleased about all that and it turn, but it turns out that and Rakitin is sort of laughing and thinking of how the fall of Alyosha is going to be and then Rakitin makes the mistake of saying his elder stinks and that's just exactly the thing that's driving me, driving Alyosha crazy and into despair is that Father Zosima's body is not performing a miracle against the laws of physics and chemistry. In fact, his body remains purer and, do, and more perfectly, doesn't smell a bit, even though the weather is warm and the windows are closed and so forth. And just as he lays all that out so that you can understand the, the physics and chemistry of it, that, but but Zosima's body is really decomposing in just a normal way in a normal time. But it's been interpreted by the enemies of Zosima to be that uh, it shows that Zosima wasn't really uh, a saint or at least a, an elder. And, um, and it shows that... The, that there, there, there's nothing, nothing happens against the laws of physics and chemistry. And if, if this is going to be a story about a miracle, I'm telling you, it's going to be a pretty strange one because the chances of there being the miracles of, that show that the Zosima's body decomposing is good or miracles composed, showing it's bad. Dostoevsky goes, yes, goes out of his way to show that in the case of Zosima, the windows were closed, there were... Is that right? No flowers, that's right. And it was a hot day. And then finally maybe Zosima does stink, but that's all right. Because it's, I mean, that, it's just the laws of physics and chemistry. It has no deep significance. And that's fine. But the, the important thing that, that this is all a kind of subplot in the story about what happens when Alyosha... When Rakitin says to Alyosha that his father stinks, and the, the elder Zosima stinks, and Alyosha goes into a kind of crash, uh, Grushenka feels sorry for him 
and she sort of picks him up and gets him to sit on her lap. Uh, she did that a little earlier in the story. But anyway, she's, he's, she's sitting on his lap, and now he, he sees how sorry she, they are. Um, who is? How sorry Alyosha is. And Alyosha sees how sorry Grushenka is over the death of Zosima. And then, then comes the, the part I want to talk about after all that. What happens is something where there is, a, that, that Alyosha feels a feeling of the intensest and purest interest. That's on 320. Is it all 320? Yes, 320. But we haven't got to the punchline yet. And that look is, again, this passing on of agape love. Only now it's called this intense and purest interest. But the interesting thing I wanted to just show you is, remember I've said Dostoevsky, when he does baptism, makes it clear that he's talking about baptism by having the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When he's talking about, uh, what do you talk about next? Puzzle. Who? Remind me. Miracles. Well, he did after baptism. Well, I could look. Uh, so, okay, I'll look. Uh, oh, well, it's, it's the giving of the uh, nuts and the, and the, and the doctor. And, but now comes this look of this purest interest. And then comes the part I want to stress. It looks like what, what's happened is that uh, Alyosha did not get seduced by Grushenka. In fact... He, he got into the, they got into this chain of love together, and they, and then what, what Rakitin says on 320 is the important thing. 320? 29. Is that right? Maybe I'm on 330. That would be a mistake. No, I'm not. Okay, then I have to look. Well, the challenge is, if those of you who have the book, to help me find the crucial statement that Rokitin makes. 329. Loud. 329. 229, and I've been looking. 329. 329, and I've been looking on 330. Let's try 329. Okay, here's Rakuten, Rakuten on 329. Rakuten couldn't control himself. Well, so you've been sa- so you saved the dinner, the sinner. He laughed spitefully. Have you, eh? So you see, the miracles you were looking for, out for, just have now have come to pass. So I just want you to get used to this and read it when, on your own when you read the brothers. There's always a moment in which Dostoevsky tells you exactly which particular Christian practice or sacrament that the, has da- now been shown to not be wiped out with the sacred, but what, it, what its phenomenology is and that it's doing fine if you're, if you're sensitive to it. So there was, so we get to see a miracle, but how was that a miracle? What was the miracle? Well, it was sort of partly passing on agape love. I think that would do it. But I think there's a further miracle, the way the plot is set up, that is Grushenka has this problem that her old Polish lover, who seduced her when she was 17 and then left her alone. She fell into terrible times. So she's been miserable thanks to this Polish lover. And now his wife has died in Poland and he's come to, to propose marriage to Grushenka. And she is, not, not on, she is not only delighted and grateful, but she's furious and outra- outraged and, 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 sp- and spiteful because uh, he treated her so badly. So in her language, she says to Alyosha, she doesn't know whether to go back to her Polish lover like a dog or like a, what's the other? Hmm. Oh dear. Like a dog, yeah. She goes either back like a dog or with a knife. 
she and that is she's going to either she's going to either revenge herself and kill the Polish lover, or she's going to give in and marry him and let, let her let, be his slave. And Aliosha's response to that is, she says, Alia, what should I do? And Aliosha says, you've you've forgiven him already. And what does that mean? Well, it seems to mean that given two destructive, two equally destructive possibilities, the knife or the dog, this love between Alyosha and Grushenka have got, has gotten rid of, of her sense of humiliation and worthlessness, given her enough strength to be able to simply go back to the Polish lover and look him over and decide without either of those destructive alternatives what the best thing to do is and that's what she does. She, she, does, she just simply, but, but Alyosha sort of cuts this short and just says, don't even bother to go back and look at him because in effect, it's, it's, you've already forgiven him. And, and to sort of sum it up, what happened? Out of two destructive possibilities, a third possibility, which was positive and made life, a good life possible for Grushenka, came about. And that's, a kind of positive miracle. So, I, and the main reason I tell you that more detailed story is because it's on a case in the book, with, of which there are many, where Dostoevsky will just name it, what it is that he wants to tell you about, what, what Christian sacrament that is still going strong, but is endangered by science, if people don't appreciate it and see it, and he wants to tell you about it and show it to you, he just showed you a miracle and the miracles do happen, and they don't violate physics and chemistry. That's the other requirement. Physics and chemistry is doing fine, and miracles aren't destroying it. The, the miracle is the creation of a new possibility for Grushenka out of the passing on of the agape love, and that, and Dostoevsky tells you so. And that leads to the general issue of miracles, which Alyosha, which Dostoevsky then takes up. But I want to see if I, where, I've, where I've gotten to so far. Well, I've got to you where, where Alyosha says, smiling, he says to Grushenka, but you've forgiven him already. And when she says, that's where I want to be. Uh, and now I'm on page 327. Why did you not come before you angel? We know that Rakitin has been a devil. And he is the devil. And we know also that Alyosha is an angel. People are constantly saying that. And one point Dostoevsky really gets carried away. I don't, I don't want to try to find it in a hurry. But where the person says they hear his wings unfolding. I mean, as he's doing his good deed. But it would mainly the point is that Alyosha is, is the angel and Rakitin is the devil. There's a funny passage where when Rakitin... Rakitin can't stand Alyosha being there. Now, let me see if I can see that. Oh, yeah, okay. So Rakitin goes on. This is still 329. And Rakitin, when Alyosha says... when Alyosha says, you've forgotten, you've forgiven him already, and so forth. And, and now that was the last straw for Rakitin. And he says, why the devil, notice, and I take, uh, I take you up. What is that? Damnation? T take you all, what Rakitin is saying to the group. And each of you, he cried suddenly, why the devil did I take up with you? I don't want to know you from time from this time forth. Go ahead. There's your road. And he turns and, and, and left. Oh, and that's, that's the end of that episode. But now we're going to get to really the, the hard ones, the, the, the very important ones. And that is... The, for, the forever experience, which is on 333. 
what's, what's happening, we're just moving to another uh, Christian sacred experience, but it's one that turns out to be very important at the end of the book, so we have to look at it now on 333. He's weeping. He, he falls on the ground, and he kisses the ground. This is Alyosha, does this, following the what Father Zosima told him he should be doing. And he uh, vowed passionately to love the earth, that is it, forever and ever. And he cries over it and so forth. But what I want you to pay attention to here, because I want to talk about it a lot later, is that there is this important forever experience. Uh, I'll t- I, so I can't help telling you sort of ahead of time that what, what goes on in this moment is a kind of temporality which is different than the everyday kind of temporality where events occur now and now and now and now and you begin to forget the early ones. There are sacred experiences which when they occur are so important in your life that you'll never forget them again. And, and they will be moments of joy, which you will remember. We'll go back to that in a minute. But when, and, and, and so I wanted to read this crucial passage on 333. It was as though some idea, idea is bad. I don't know if that's the right translation. It's not an idea. It's more fundamental than that. It's as though some idea had seized the sovereignty of his mind. This is Alyosha's mind. And it was for all his life and forever and ever. That's a very important phrase. That, that means that there's something that is sort of saved from the everyday temporality of meaninglessness and forget, forgetting. And that you, it, it, you will be in touch with it all your, all your life and it will give everyone meaning. And that, that, that's, that's a, a sacred experience too, the forever and ever. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the experience of uh, what, we just, what I just said, lasting meaning in your life that you can come back to and organize as your life and, it, and gives it meaning from the, from the start, from the experience on. I think that's all I need to forget that. He, well, and, and maybe it says more, yeah, well, I read this, and never, never his life long could Alyosha forget that minute. Now, it's going to come back at the end of the book that Alyosha is going to create that kind of uh, experience for the boys, which you haven't heard about, but you hopefully read about. And at the very end of the book, Alyosha creates the sacred forever memory for all the boys. Uh, and that's the very last page of the brothers. So he, in, in the very middle here, Ali, uh, Dostoevsky is setting it up. So I had to talk about it. And Okay, so now I'm going to just do a few more. How are we doing? Of the sacraments. I stop at 3.30 or whatever. Oh, that's, that's Berkeley time. What? 30, 30, 30, okay, you, you tell me <laughs> when I've got 10 minutes to go or something. Sure. I don't want to stop before that forever experience at the end. <laughs> but in the meantime, after the miracles and after the forever experience comes other whole list, as I said, of Christian practices and experiences which uh, sort of structure the book. So, but I'm only going to look at some. But after the forever experience, the next thing you could look at would be the uh, confession. That, now, that's a whole story. Dostoevsky's going to tell you what, what confession is, what it, what's it good for, it's, why is it sacred, and, and he's going to call it confession. And it's, it's in, the, in the language of the book, it's the mysterious visitor. So the mysterious visitor comes to Father Zosima, and after seeing him many times, and it's very tense, and very good Dostoevsky, and very moving, finally the mysterious visitor gets himself to admit to Zosima that uh, he 
murdered his girlfriend, not Zosima's girlfriend. But uh, he, so, uh, so the mysterious visitor, Michael is, Michael is his name, has, confesses it. And then comes a description from Dostoevsky of what, why it's important to confess. And it turns out to be absolutely crucial. You have to know more that after this murder, Mikhail had uh, becomes so feels terribly guilty, and then because of that, he gives lots of money to good causes. He becomes the a super good citizen. He takes special good care of his citizen of his children. Everybody likes him and admires him, and we're told all that because now it looks like he's. Like, then why does he want to confess? He seems to have a good life. But, but from his point of view, that is, Mikhail, who's suffering, uh, it's, it's not a good life because he can't relate to anybody as the ex-murderer of the girlfriend. That's not who he really is. He really is the ex-murderer of his girlfriend. And so his relation to his wife is just a lie, and his relation to his loving children that he loves too is just a lie. And he is in complete isolation. And he is, as he says, in hell. Because hell is isolation. And he can't relate to anybody, and he can't pass on the agape love to anybody. He can't receive it from anybody. So he's in terrible shape until he confesses. But even that isn't enough. And this is an interesting Dostoevsky point. It isn't enough for him to go tell Alyosha that he uh, killed his girlfriend, Mikhail, tell Alyosha that Mikhail killed Mikhail's girlfriend. It's, it's, it's that he uh, is, he has to tell the whole community. So, and then he gets all upset about that. And how, in other words, he has to sort of destroy this image of him as the good citizen and the, the good philanthropist and so forth. And he calls the whole community of, together and he reads, reads an announcement explaining that he killed this girl and exactly how he did it and when he did it and so forth. And that's, that you would think would be the end of the story because he then, he becomes joyful. And because he's connected now, he can, he can, he thinks, face his wife, but he thinks it's pretty painful. He has to face his wife, but, and she has to forgive him, knowing about the murder and so forth. But now there's a sort of sub-miracle I just realized, but I don't think Dostoevsky stresses it, or I may have missed it. The sub-miracle is that nobody believes him. They don't believe that he, this, this good father, philanthropist, nice guy, is, is a murderer. And so Dostoevsky rigs it so that he dies happy, not only because he's able now to love his wife and kids, but they don't think he is a murderer and they love him for who, who, what he's become. It's like, um, it's exactly the situation of somebody on, in, on death row who has a kind of conversion and then, and then um, real, and they become really a, a good guy, and yet they can't be sort of forgiven. Uh, so, so this, so he's become a good guy, and for that he's at least able now to relate to his wife and kids, and experience joy, and and then he says, hell is isolation, and being really together with other people is joy. And he knows that, and he knows, and, and he's being forgiven by everybody, even though, because they know, this is why I was telling this idea of a deathbed, or a, 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 a what? A death row? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> My prompter. Uh, so, yes, so, so he, he, he experiences the, the death row conversion. That is, the, the, the Mekel experiences the situation in which he's become a, a lovable man because he's confessed to the community and to his wife and kids, and he's been forgiven by all of them, 
he, only a, a sort of a misunderstanding. They forgive him because they can't believe he could do such a thing. But it doesn't matter because they allow, can love him and he can love them. That's the bottom line. And that's, that's just to show that you can, do the, you can do the mysterious visitor and talk about... Well, I'll read you something. It's, uh, it, all of this is, remember, in, in the interest of telling the story about the ba- various possible practices, Christian practices, that preserve the sacred, this is just another one. Be, being able to understand confession and being able to confess and being able to f- forgive, although that's a complicated one, uh, all of this is what's being explained in the mysterious visitor story. And, and, the, and the mysterious visitor, Dostoevsky chooses for his uh, telling, showing you the sacred in, in, um, by showing you, in this case, confession. He, and uh, Michael says, now I, dare, now I dare not love my neighbor and even my own children. And then he says, I know I'll be in heaven. It'll be heaven for me, heaven when I confess. And finally he does confess, and then he says, I, um, 14 years I've been in hell. That's the story about hell. Hell is isolation, it turns out. And, and it was heaven in my heart. There's heaven being existentialized. It was heaven in my heart from the moment I had done what I had to do, namely confess. Okay, now, those are all easy cases. And I would just, and, and you can find all the rest if you look carefully uh, at the point where he tells you, like, it was a miracle. And you, he just, pong, tells you, or it was a baptism, and he just tells you. But now comes a com- more, much more complicated issue. And, but it's all still about what happened to the sacred. And is it preserved or destroyed by science? Which is it going to be? Is there a way the sacred can be can preserved without getting rid of science, keeping science, but saving the sacred? Well, the the the, the issue turns on a way that I wish I could tell you sort of crispy, but it's a complicated issue, and I don't know how to tell it crisply. But I know that it's Dostoevsky is showing that he's up on what's going on in science. By the way, he was apparently an engineering student for, at, for, at first because his father wanted to be an engineering student and paid the tuition if he was an engineering student. So it, and he really, I think he really likes science. I see no reason to think that Dostoevsky wants to show that science is really not getting it the way the universe is. I think he thinks science is getting it right about the way the universe is. But that, he doesn't think that that undermines the sacred. But now comes the crunch. Dostoevsky gives him a, himself a tough test. What, would, what is the test? Well, it's Claude Bernard, and Claude Bernard is the discoverer of neurons, and Rakitin t- tells, t- in order to break Alyosha's faith once and for, Dimitri's faith once and for all, uh, um, Rakitin tells Dimitri this, about the, the discovery of neurons, and then Dim- Dimitri has a just the kind of breakdown that Rakitin hoped he would. So this is the crucial moment for that. Imagine inside the head, the nerves. There are all sorts of little, they have all sorts of little tails, the little tails of those nerves. Um, that's, that's why I see them. I think, be, I think because of those little tails, not at all because I've got a soul. Rakitin explained it all to me yesterday, brother, and it simply bowled me over. It's magnificent, Alyosha, the science. A new man is arriving, arising. That I understand. And yet I'm sorry to lose God. Now, how is Alyosha going to ha- handle that? How, how can he keep the neurons and, get, uh, and not have uh, Dimitri lose God? Well... It's, it's, a, it's, it's to that Dimitri has an experience of the new man. But the new man that uh, Rakitin tried to get him to believe in 
was the simple sort of psychological neuro, neuro person with no soul. And that's not what, what uh, Alyosha is trying to get him to believe in. So, so what happens then is, uh, what, what does Alyosha do about it? Well, he's, Dimitri says, I'm sorry to lose God. And Alyosha says, well, that's a good thing anyway, said Alyosha. And he changes the subject. He never did, go, go, goes into trying to show that somehow the neurons, uh, though they are necessary for thinking, don't replace the fact that you've got a soul and that you can experience love and so forth. But Alyosha, uh, Dostoevsky doesn't work it out. Yeah, there is, but I believe, I believe that that's what he's doing. I mean, if you, that's the only way I can understand what he's doing is to show that, that there is a way of just turning and walking away from what Ali Archer said. He doesn't have to answer it, because if he tries to answer it, then he assumes that there are neurons, and he assumes that neurons are a different sort of thing, physical kind of, well, mind, brain-related thing, and he assumes that there's... Uh, mind-related soul things, and he's got to decide how they fit together. But I think he, he thinks that the various pr presumption that there is this sort of Cartesian separation between the mind things and the body things, and how in the world you're going to deal with neurons and keep the soul, is just, I think Dostoevsky thinks rightly, it, that would be a mistake to enter in an argument about that. But what you want to do is, you see that they're in an entirely different world. You can't convince them. They won't convince you. But you, 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 you see that you, if you can't share the other person's world, you can't have an argument in which one or the other wins or loses. He just walks away from it. But he does face it. That's why I want to put it down. He really sees that you've got to have a story of what you're supposed to do when you discover that your brain is doing all this by neurons. And his answer is a pretty strange one, is to say, well, uh, Dimitri says, remember, I'm sorry to lose God. And Alyosha says, well, that's too bad, and walks away. I think that's a proposal of how you're supposed to deal with these people, not just because you're stubborn, but because they're, they're in a wrong ontology. They're in a wrong universe. They've got presuppositions which you, can't, which you don't share with each other, so you can't refute each other. But you, can, but you can walk away from the neurons, and you can walk away from the conclusion that if you have neurons, you have no soul. And that's what he does. So, but now we're, how, how are we doing for time? Um, easily another 10 hmm? minutes. 10 minutes, just what I want. Because now uh, there are two more issues. One is the resurrection issue, but there's not much to say about that, really. Uh, the, the, Dimitri discovers that he's a new man, but it's a different sort of new man than the new man that Alyosha... Um, or, oh, sorry, Dimitri, yes, is a new man, and not the new man that Rakitin is talking about, which is the man of uh, neuroscience. But what is this new man, then? Well, it's on page 5... 49. So on 549, he tell, uh, Dimitri tells Alyosha, Brother, these last two months, I found in myself a new man. A new man has risen in me. He was hidden in me and so forth. Um, in other words, there is an experience of resurrection, of being a new man. Dimitri has always been referred, refers to himself as carrying a cross, and now it turns out that that, that gets, can, can be converted into Dimitri's problems, which we haven't time to go into. But it also turns out that Dimitri has himself been reborn, and he says he has. I don't know if I have a quote for that or not. Uh, no, it's, all I've got here is that there's a new man. 
but it's the new, the new man who turns out to want to take on the suffering of the, of the uh, prisoners in the underground and, and done all kinds of good deeds and so forth, and, and a whole story about Dimitri's, in effect, really going from crucifixion to resurrection in his experience is, is worked out. But I, there's not much really more to say about it. Um, but it's important that it's sort of named the re- resurrection and a, that all around the new man. That, that, they're, that the, the, the new man can either be the science natural, naturalism new man, or the new man can be, as it is for Dostoevsky, the, resurrect, the, the, the crucified, suffering, resurrected, uh, pers- uh, person that, that Dimitri becomes. But then that, that now I want to just use my last minutes to raise a problem. But first, yeah, I want to say that okay, we're going, we're going to get a story now about the founding of a church and the no, the, and come back to sacred memories, those, uh, 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 which is, but let's do the founding of the church because that's one, uh, one of Alyosha's little, um, uh, Dostoevsky's little jokes. Um, so this is on 329. Three twenty nine. Hmm. Oh yeah, here, here it is. So now we, we get a new scene, and the boys are all waiting at the funeral of Elisha, and. They, and Alyosha isn't there yet, but then Alyosha arrives, and it says, Alyosha was met by the shouts of the boys, Elisha's schoolfellows. They had been impatiently expecting him and were glad that he had come at last. And now look at this. There were about 12 of them. And where was it taking place? It was taking place at the stone, which was Elisha's favorite stone where he wanted to be married. Now, why would I, I mean, if you read it, you, the page is so funny. Uh, Dostoevsky's going along describing everything in a normal sort of way, and all of a sudden he mentions, just stops and says, and there were 12 of the boys at the rock. And then he goes back <laughs> doing it. It's just him telling you, look, that's what we're now showing the sacred in, and he shows it. Um, and now that connects up with the forever. And that's on, everything now happens on 718. But it is so hard to understand that I won't be able to tell you for sure how to understand it. I'll give you a possible, possible way of understanding it. This has all got to do with the forever experience. And the founding of the church is tied up with the fact that there are 12 boys. That's just to tell you it's the founding of the church. It doesn't say, Dostoevsky doesn't say it was the founding of the church. <clears throat> the way Dostoevsky operates, you should believe me now, I've given you enough examples, is to just show you the founding of a church by showing you the way the boys get together and, and do what? They get together and, perform, and produce with the help of Alyosha, childhood memories, which they will have forever, memories of their current joyfulness of all being together, and memories that stick with them all their lives, that they were joyful, and when they were all together. And that's what the being in a loving community, this kind of church which preserves the sacred and preserves the forever, is all about. And it all happens on page 417 uh, and 418. But I want to... 
and, and now I have to read you a lot of it just because you have to hear that this is the forever experience we're talking about. Alyosha says, and it's a church service. It's a, 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 kind of a community praying rhythm. It, so, uh, so they say, hooray for Karamazov. And then he says, Alyosha, and may the dead boy's memory live forever. Alyosha added, forever, the boys claimed, in, chimed in again. You see, the forever is the important thing. It's the, it's sort of how to get out of meaningless time into meaningless time. So, Karamasa cried Alyosha. No, I'm not sure for that, I don't think. Yeah, maybe so. Just a second. Well, I, there's more of this going back and forth of forever, but that's enough to show you that it gets chanted again and again. And now comes the, the thing that's hard to understand, which I saved till last. Um, it looks like they've all just agreed that this forever experience was... Uh, so the, the, the thing that was going to give meaning to the rest of their lives... And that's fine, and we know what kind of meaning and how it works, and it will last forever. But now something happens which is very surprising. Karamazov, cried Kolya, can it be true what's taught us in religion, that we shall all rise again from the dead and shall live and see each other again, all, Elisha too? Now, that is to say, you've told us about forever, you told us about the sacred experience of a kind of temporality which doesn't die moment by moment. Uh, so, and, 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 and now Callum, uh, Kolya is asking, well, how does that story you told us about the sacred and about time and memory and forever relate to the official Christian view? And that's what he does. He says, and that Dostoevsky is amazing to try to take this on. Karamazov cried Kolya, can it be true what's taught in religion, that we shall all rise again from the dead and shall live and see each other again, all? Uh, and now, what does Alyosha answer? He ought to say, well, I've just told you the sacred experience involved in the forever. What more would you want? But he doesn't say that. He says, Certainly we shall all rise again. Certainly we shall see each other and shall tell each other with joy and glad gladness all that has happened. Alyosha answered. So it looks like the rapture is something that he just buys. Because the, the boys ask him, is this sort of, sort of literal Christian story about immortality true? And Alyosha says, yeah, it's true. But then comes the beginning of the taking it back where... Dostoevsky says, yeah, all this will happen. We'll all get our bodies back and so forth. Alyosha said, half laughing, half enthusiastic. And the next sentence is about how they're going to, they are going to go, let's go eat pancakes. There's some weird thing going on there. Alyosha's been telling you a whole complicated story about the forever experience and how basic it is, and how important it is, and how real it is, and sacred it is. And then he finally also tells you about the, the rapture, and he, the literal story, and he uh, seems to take that seriously too. There must be some way in which both of them could be right, uh, if this story's going to make any sense. And that's a hard story to tell. It looks like the story that's more important is the story about how they're all going to see each other again and love each other and remember each other. It's about the chain of love, and it's about that version of the sacred and the church-like community that it makes possible. But it looks like it's not incompatible with the fact that when you die, the whole story of, res of being, coming out of the grave in the flesh and seeing each other again and so forth, that could be true, too. Um, and it looks like Alyosha, uh, Dostoevsky wants to say, yes, they can both be true. They're not incompatible. That's already the first thing to say. 
And the second thing is, and not only are, if, when they're both true, the one that does sort of the phenomenology of the sacred, which is what Dostoevsky's been doing for the whole book, is more important than the one, the, the, the rapture, which gets one sentence, half laughing, half enthusiastic. He's not going to go outright and deny it, but he's certainly not going to go to the wall affirming that we're going to all come back. And he doesn't need it because he saved the sacred already by his whole book giving you the, say, 15 or so sacred practices that Christians do have that does give their life meaning. And that's good enough. Now, I want to say one more thing about that. There's sort of parentheses. There's a whole mess about translation at that point, um, which I think we just have to f- f- read. I'm, I was reading for years the old Constant Garnet, the original translation of uh, the Brothers Karamatra, which goes way back to when I don't even remember, but it's long ago. So, so does, does 1912. 1912. So there is the one I've been reading you, and it's been about forever, forever, and so forth. And now, if you all go home and look in your copy, which you probably don't have the uh, Dover thrift, thrift edition, uh, then you will discover that all the forevers have been replaced by the translators who are so pleased with themselves, as they say in the preface, that they've sort of cleaned things up with the word um, uh, um, eternal. And every, every, every place where we, we hear memory live forever, may the dead boy's memory live forever, the new translation says, may the dead boy's memory live eternally. But I don't even know what that means. But I don't think Dostoevsky ever said that. Um, that is, it's, it's, they, he says that they will, he says to the boys, they'll always remember how, the, how they were together, hand in hand, and that's fine. Um, and so the boys are chanting forever, forever, and call you sort of d- doesn't deny this story. He just says, and is it true to that? And then he tells the story about the, re- the resurrection of the flesh. And Dostoevsky leaves it at that. I think, for me, the important thing is that in leaving it like that, he's done the one thing that he needs to do and he promises to do, and that is answer, what do you get when you say Phenomenal, give the phenomenology of the sacred or existentialize the sacred, which is what I've been doing. And that's when we hear the, the good things that all, we will always be together. And let's see what it says, Aliasha. It went, well, Aliasha says, certainly we shall see each other again, Aliasha answered, half laughing, half enthusiastic. And now that's the thing I'm talking about. And then Kolya, and, and then Aliasha says, I'm with the very last paragraph of the book now, always so, all our lives, hand in hand, hooray for the Karamazovs, Kolya cry. Now, all the, that makes fine sense. What doesn't make sense is always so, all our lives, hand in hand. Oh, sorry. What doesn't work is eternally so, all our lives, hand in hand. So to eternally, you don't even have hands. Eternally is this big other picture of the, the religious or maybe platonic world. And the idea... The, the, the translators have taken this great Dostoevsky move. And, 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 but I see one more thing. There's a kind of pressure on Dostoevsky to have Kolya uh, Kol, uh, come in and ask, well, how does this relate to the rapture? How does this relate to the resurrection of the flesh and so forth? And Dostoevsky wants you to know that that's what the issue is here. Remember every time when we talked, there was, we always had an issue. There was the miracles, 
there was baptism, there was uh, the, the uh, in, incarnation, I didn't say much about that, that's Markle, uh, and so forth. And now Dostoevsky needs to tell you, in effect, as he always does, well, what has he just been existentializing? Or te- or, and then is where he's, he, he could be saying, well, what I'm existentializing is exactly that I'm telling you that you don't need this traditional religious way of thinking about it as long as you've got the phenomenology of the sacred preserved. So, and he is doing that, at least. He's saying, look, we've just, been in, we've just discussed the issue of the, whether we will rise again. And he's ready to say, certainly we'll rise again and we'll see each other and so forth. But we want to we, we find out that this certainty that we will rise again isn't something that he really has to stand behind, Dostoevsky or Alyosha. All he has to do is tell you that's what he's been describing as a, po- a sacred possibility. But what he hasn't got is to have to say that that's a necessary part of the sacred. He could do his whole story on the sacred in what he did in the whole book, take up all the Christian practices and give you a a living interpretation of what it would be like to have miracles under those conditions and baptism under those conditions and and, and resurrection even under those conditions, which Dimitri goes through resurrection, but it doesn't mean that he gets his body back after he dies and comes out of the tomb. It means that he begins a new life. And that's all Dostoevsky needs, but he tells you what he's been doing. He's been talking about the, the rapture, and his, rea- and his answer to that, to talk about the rapture is, he says, of course that certainly happens, that we will r- rise from the grave. Alyosha says, half laughing, half enthusiastically. That's what I'm trying to tell you what the, that strange phrase means, when it doesn't mean, well, sure, that's the right answer, that's the only important answer, all this is otherwise is just phenomenological drivel. On the contrary, the issue has been, all right, what, what is the role of the sacred? And the answer has been, we've had all of the sacred existentialized, phenomenologized in the course of the book, and we can stop there, and then we would stop laughing half enthusiastic. Okay. fascinating talk. Uh, we do have a relatively short interval of time for some questions, and I know there's at least one already because uh, Mikawai has asked to have the privilege. Uh, so, 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 go ahead, Mikawai. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, a very detailed talk. Uh, of course, it's a, a little cheeky of me because I could signal around the head of everyone else, but I just wanted to ask... Uh, um, whether um, you think uh, Dostoevsky's view um, on how the sacred can be um, still preserved in a scientific paradigm could be reiterated in terms of a cognitive dualism. We, we, um, in, a, in a scientific age, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So in a scientific age, yes. So okay. uh, whether this could be reiterated in terms of a cognitive dualism um, where you look at the world either uh, in terms of causes or in terms of reasons. So if you look at uh, Rakitin's uh, idea of, of the neuronal network um, being the ultimate explanation of everything we do, it is only the ultimate explanation of uh, everything we do in terms of causes. So when somebody makes a decision, um, and that analyzing uh, the neuronal activity can give you the cause uh, of why something took place uh, when a decision was made. You can uh, trace it back to a certain reaction that took place and that resulted in something else happening. Um, however, you can't ask uh, uh, of the scientist and that explanation will give you nothing in terms of reasons um, for why a decision was made. Um, so it seems that reasons are irreducible just to uh, the neuronal activity that stands behind them, uh, that um, you know, is a parallel explanation to how we, talk, how we can talk about at least human uh, 
um, conduct. So do, do you think this might be an idea that's uh, uh, being, being um, uh, articulated at some, on some level by, by Dostoevsky? Hmm. I don't, but I, I'm trying to think why I don't. Well, I guess I should think why, you, why, would, why would you think that, given that I, can you think of any episodes in the book where it turns out that this distinction between the reason and causes plays an important role? Maybe you just said that and I missed it, but say it again. Well, to, to me it seems uh, uh, characters like Rakitin seems to seem to seem to be advocating a certain form of reductionism um, whereby uh, uh, the ways in which uh, the characters seem to value the world and understand the world are just brought down to the way uh, things occur in the world mechanically mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, yeah so that's right decisions that's... and thought processes being reducible uh, for example, in Rakiti's idiom, to how things happen in the brain with neurons. Yeah. Whereas um, Alyosha uh, seems to me to be pointing uh, to a uh, way of understanding reality which just doesn't rely just on reason, just on uh, causes, uh, but refers to certain reasons for which we... Um, well, I guess that's where I... I don't find Dostoevsky looking for the reasons. It's true that he certainly has a, he mm. accepts the cause story, and that's fine for the, 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 the physical explanation of what's going on in the brain. But the alternative isn't reasoning. Nobody, nobody does much reasoning in the Brothers Karamazov, I don't mm. think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we'll have to keep a one question. One question, question. sure, Ooh, sure, I, I, sure. I think so. I'll, um, I'll put it to the audience. Um, I, I think there's one in the center just here. It's just so it's captured on, on the... Yeah. Um, so my, my question is, um, at the very end of the talk, you wondered whether or not uh, this forever experience is compatible or incompatible with the... Wait, the, wait a second. Mark, are you going to tell me what he's telling me? Because I can't hear him. Yeah. My, I, I, can, oh, I just don't hear even... unless, you, Or better even yet, if you had a microphone... Each of you, so I could hear you. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Well, I'm going to pass it around, but uh, if, you, if you just speak up to the mic, that's okay. the point yeah. at that. Uh, so, well, my question is just um, uh, you suggest that maybe these experiences for us, yes, are supposed to be compatible. Um, the idea of uh, the forever experience being something that happens here and now, and on the other hand, the traditional Christian doctrine of the resurrection. And I'm wondering what you think of the idea that the reason why for us, yes, those two are compatible is. Because in that moment of enthusiasm for Alyosha, this is precisely when um, the resurrection is sort of prefigured. Or in a sense, it's a sort of experiential, it is an experience in which one sort of experiences the hope of the bodily resurrection. Or in some sense, that, that doctrine itself is disclosed. And that, that's precisely what explains the enthusiasm. Can you yeah, so summarize? Yeah, so he's asking, you pose the question how to make them com compatible, these two different accounts, a more traditional metaphysical account of Christianity um, and his existential account. And I think Stephen's suggesting that the, the traditional account, the hope of a bodily resurrection, plays an important role still. And, and, and Dostoevsky needs that. I think that's the suggestion, right? So... Hmm. So uh, yeah. maybe another way to put it is, doesn't the actual hope of a bodily resurrection add something to life that, that we're not going to get simply on the existential story? Well, I think that might be true, but it wouldn't be compatible with half laughing. Would you describe that view as half laughing, half enthusiastic about the afterlife? I think he, he's saying that's the enthusiastic half. Yes, and what's the laughing half? <laughs> I, I guess the existential half is the, the laughing half. Uh, that won't work, but I don't know what does. <laughs> okay, there, well, there was one around there, or well, otherwise there's certainly well, perhaps one at the front here, and then the, the hand towards the back there was the next to, to go up. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask uh, firstly about the forever experience itself 
and how you distinguish that from the memory of the forever experience. Uh, are those two different experiences? Uh, uh, I mean, are those not just by quality to be two different experiences? And uh, I also wanted to ask, in terms of existential phenomenology, whether you can, because this doesn't cover all the existential experiences that, uh, not uh, all the authentic <laughs> existential experiences that characters go through in uh, Dostoevsky's novels uh, range beyond just the Christian or uh, religious experiences. There are other epiphanic experiences that take place which aren't religious. Uh, and those can also be classified as sacred, depending on how you define the sacred. Uh, it's very different from your definition. But, uh, so two questions. Is the forever experience itself so is different from the memory of the forever experience? And secondly, um, is, there, is there room to understand the sacred beyond just this idea of agape love and uh, that, that, you, that, that you present? Did you get it? No. OK, so, so the first question is, is there a difference between a forever experience and the memory of the forever experience? No, that's the point. The memory is just as vivid and just as joyful making as the as the actual one that's that's the kind of special temporality involved so it's not a forever experience unless it's operative right then uh, right then but then throughout the rest of your life yes and being recalled yeah okay oh. and then then the other question was uh well he posed it a couple of different ways but but i take it the the important question is, isn't this reducing the experience of the sacred to an experience of agape love? Or is there in Dostoevsky more to the sacred experience than just that? Hmm, now that's interesting. Uh, there's, but the, the, it isn't all agape love that's living forever. It's because it may not even involve love. It's the boy's memories of having been together in a church-like religious experience, which they will, which is constantly renewable and accessible to them, but there's no real talk. There's not much. I don't think any talk about love when the, where the schoolboy, except loving Alyosha, where the, the schoolboys are involved. Uh, it's always other stuff. Uh, the love. Uh, so maybe well I know there was a question back there somewhere I know there were several more dotted about but if I, I think it was that one and I can see there's one over here and we probably have time just for those two Can, can you limit them to one? such a, a commitment to a more traditional understanding of Christianity. 
but also because Christians have always been operating on two levels. They've always been having a, a here and now moral interpretation of, of these, these Christian ideals or doctrines and a, a more robustly metaphysical supernatural reading. Yeah, I guess Christians have been doing that. But then Dostoevsky doesn't want to do that, and that's uh, what we what well, we just. I think that's about. the question. What, why should we think Dostoevsky is not playing this this same? Well, we're game back where we were. Why he's half laughing and half, half, half laughing uh, and half yeah, it, and, and why it got only one uh, paragraph in a seven hundred eighty page seven hundred eighty page book. Uh, he doesn't elaborate the traditional view or defend it or anything. He just. It passes off in one, in one tiny paragraph. That's yeah. I suppose you, you might look at the, the different kinds of monks and how they're treated. Hmm. In right? the book? In the book. In the brothers. The more metaphysical ones are always treated with suspicion. Bad ones. Yeah, yeah Father Farrapont and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, less crazy people. Right. Uh, and the admirable ones like Zosima never seem to concern themselves too much with the, with, with the, with the metaphysical. Yes. Zosima has been, been given a bad speech, by the way, by, was it, I guess it's the translator. No, it's some authority supposedly on the brothers Karamazov. I'm trying to remember what it is. Never mind, I'll think about it later. We better move on. We have one more lightning pace question. <laughs> When you spoke about the going off and eating pancakes and the, the earlier one about the pound of nuts, uh, I was thinking about the sacrament of the present moment. And I think that's another reason why he would laugh at the thought of me forever as well. So I don't know if that you find that, I find that an interesting way of looking at it. The sacrament of the present moment. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't restate this one because I don't know what you mean by the sacrament of the present moment. So. Yeah, I don't either. I'm, uh, That's just one of the things that we have, as certainly in the Catholic Church. The sacrament of the present moment is really what we celebrate in Holy Communion. It's the, the, the reality of now and the blessing that we have now, which will also, of course, be in eternity. So that's how I, that helps me to understand that point. Nope. It sounds like we need to talk to some Catholics about <laughs> the sacrament of the nope. Well, perhaps on that note, we should close up, unless you'd like to make a final no, comment on that. <laughs> okay, well, well, I think we should certainly have another round of applause for <laughs> Professor Dreyfus. <laughs> and thank you all so much for coming. This was the ultimate uh, seminar in this series. You can watch them all online at humanephilosophy.com or at the Ian Ramsey Centre uh, website as well. And hopefully there'll be some more next year as well. Thank you.